This is Kevin. Wait, sorry. Hi, sorry. Let's start over. Okay. Oh, no. Hi, Misfits. This is Kevin. And this is Kate. Welcome to Horrorwood. (laughs) Horrorwood. Horrorwood. How are you? I'm tired. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> so usually I just do coffee here. Right. But this morning I was like, I need a little something extra. I haven't been to Starbucks. I can't remember the last time I went to Starbucks. Oh, really? And I ordered today. Nice. Got myself a little mocha because I was like, I'm going to need to uh, get myself together here. I go to Starbucks probably once or twice a week. There's always like really? one day that I don't feel like making cold brew. or. Sure. I'm out of coffee and forgot to go get some at the store. But I have a bunch of stars right now on my card. And I can get a free Trenta cold brew with some pumpkin sauce. Of course. And two shots of espresso with four Splenda. And oat milk. That's my coffee order. And a Trenta. I would have thought you would have gone for more shots. No, no, no. Just two. Oh, no, no, no. (laughs) He was very serious when he said that. I used to do three, like two or three years ago and I was just like ah, da, 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 uh, yeah. the entire time but then I I like I was like I have to not do this so the next time I went I got a venti with like one shot and the barista was like oh taking it down a notch huh <laughs> oh and I was like you bet such shame from the barista I know bitch I love them though the oh, baristas okay. at the Starbucks on Ridge there's a drive through that's the one I go to nice they're really sweet and one of the bar one of the baristas is so Oh. Like gorgeous, tall, dark, handsome. Yeah, absolutely. We had a great night last night. Oh my god, last night, Kate. That was so much fun. Thank you. I'm so glad you enjoyed it. I You're was welcome. like, I never, I've never enjoyed a sporting event. How many have you been to? <laughs> well, I mean, a handful. Okay. The, I like the hockey. Mm-hmm, the hockey. The hockey. Soccer, don't get me started. You heard what I said last right, night. They right. are so fucking dramatic. <laughs> S- soccer people or football if you're in Europe, come on. <laughs> I like get it. it together. <laughs> Wrap your knees. I don't know what you have to do. See, that's how I feel about basketball. But stop throwing yourself to the ground and, and being screaming. like, oh, my, n- he my legs. Me. <laughs> Someone help me. My favorite thing from last night was when you said, so how many tries do they get? <laughs> And I was like, for three or so hours, Kate was explaining baseball to me. <laughs> By the end of it, though, I got it. You were an I expert. I think I got it. You were talking shit. I was talking shit. Uh, there was, you know, the bases were loaded. There were strikes. There were fouls. Look at you knowing the terms. Grand slam. Yeah. I got it. Yeah. It's worth five points. Incorrect. I think it's five. Okay. Kate says it's four. but The thing is, I am also not an expert oh, in the sports okay. ball but baseball but you, I like. you were yeah. watching and like you knew everything that was happening well because i do like baseball right. that's like the one thing that i enjoy i like yeah. the atmosphere i understand the game yeah like football still don't understand it don't get it matt has tried to explain it to me others have tried to explain it to me don't understand don't mm-hmm. know what's going on downs what is that yards i don't get it but baseball i'm like you just got to hit the ball and run around those bases yeah and that is them. i can comprehend that same Good. And yeah, I football like I no matter how much I try to understand it, I can't. I just can't. That's kind of how I feel about the guy we're going to talk about today. I just don't understand okay, that him. That was a good segue. Thank you. Thank you. <gasps> Happy Thursday morning. Oh, oh, oh. Although this comes out I think Monday. Happy Monday morning. <laughs> I did not tell you what we're talking about today. You didn't. You said you were keeping a secret. Mainly because you know pretty much all horror movies. I do. And I found one that to me is very obscure. I had never heard of it before. So I was like, maybe I can stump Kevin. Ooh. And give him one that he hasn't heard. Haven't heard of? Have you seen the movie Eaten Alive? No. 
Toby Hooper. Oh, I love Toby Hooper. Yeah. He did the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Exactly. And Eaten Alive is the movie he did right after that. Oh, no, I haven't seen it. And it's said to be based in even more reality than what Texas Chainsaw Massacre was. Oh, shit. And I wanted to start like a series on horror films based on true stories. <gasps> I love that idea. So... Here we go with this one. It is wild. This is crazy. Wild. So when I say Eaten Alive, because there's two Eaten Alive movies, I'm talking about the 1976 version. Okay. Because there was another one that came out in like 80 or 81, and that's Eaten Alive! Exclamation point. This one's just Eaten Alive. No punctuation. No punctuation. Just right out there. Yes. Uh, so let's see where I am in my notes. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I because I did my notes a little different. I have like sections which I've never done, so I'm like, oh, where did I go? When I read about this case, because I I did watch the movie. You did. Uh, yes, it's free on Peacock and I think Tubi and a few other places. Oh, great! Yes, yeah, so you can watch it. It's only oh. an hour and a half. Did you enjoy it? You know, <laughs> <laughs> your face. You're like, um. It's hard to say. I enjoyed it, oh, okay. knowing that it's based on reality and it's I mean it's very wild but I will say it stars a young Robert England really yes Freddy Krueger and didn't you like work on a movie with Robert England I did and he was like the nicest sweetest little old man I love that he's the cutest uh and in this movie he's pretty young uh and he's actually not the killer so it's interesting. For any listeners who don't know, Robert England is the, is Freddy Krueger yes. in the Nightmare on Elm Street movie. An icon. He is a horror icon. Mm-hmm. Spencer and I had been working our way through all the Nightmare on Elm Streets a while oh, ago. Oh, fun. I think we got to like six. I can't remember. I don't even know how many there watched. are. There's so many. Did you see his cameo in Stranger Things? No, I've only seen season one and a few episodes of season two of Stranger Things. Oh, wow. I don't know how to respond to that. I I mean, I... I Were you not into it? Not super into it. Okay. That's fair. I don't know why. Like, it feels like it'd be be something that was right up my alley. Right. I did enjoy the first season. Mm -hmm. But for whatever the reason, the second season just didn't keep me going. Gotcha. I think once Barb got killed... Barb! I was really like, fuck this. Uh, So just to tell you a little bit about this film, it's about a man named Judd, played by Neville Brand, who runs a small, dilapidated hotel in rural East Texas. We're in Texas. We are in Texas. Toby Hooper. Toby Hooper. Was he from Texas? Yeah, he was. Okay, that makes sense. Whenever anyone upsets Judd, whether it be a hotel guest, a town resident, or a child upset over the death of her puppy... He attacks them and feeds their bodies to his pet crocodile that he keeps in a swamp next to his hotel. Then he writes the name of his victim down in a little notebook so as to keep track of his kills, I guess. Or maybe he wants to write a novel. I don't know. So it's pretty creeped out. It's pretty out there. When I read about it, I was like, what the fuck? And then I was like, I need to know more. You're telling me that this is based on a true story? Yes, I am. That is insane, Kate. And also, if anybody listening, have you seen the movie X or Pearl? You know what? I don't think I have. There's a man-eating crocodile or a man-eating alligator crocodile, whatever, in that. It makes me feel like that maybe was inspired by this. It might not have been, but. Yeah, who knows? It's so good. Please watch it. I think you'll really like it. Okay. I'll check it out. It's gruesome, but. Sure. Well, yeah. so is Eaten Alive, in case you couldn't tell yeah. by the title. <laughs> Eaten Alive. Oh, that's the other one with the exclamation point. With the exclamation point. point, yeah. This one, again, no punctuation. Eaten Alive. Mm-hmm. Just very sinister. So like I said, it is based on a true story. Oh, and God. for that story, we need to travel to a small town called Elmendorf, which is located just southeast of downtown San Antonio, Texas. Elmendorf. That sounds like something from Lord of the Rings. It kind of does. <laughs> We have to cross the mountain to Elmendorf. 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 (laughs) (laughs) The town was established in 1885 by a man named Henry Elmendorf. Back. Well, there you go. Uh, Yeah. Hey, Hen. I mean, it was really lucky for him that he (laughs) happened upon that town. (laughs) I'm going to name this Elmendorf. Back when men just went around finding land and said. 
This is my town now. By all accounts, Henry Elmendorf was a super good dude and oh, went good. on to become mayor of San Antonio. Damn. He found a town and then he was like, I'm going to run this other town. Yeah. <laughs> Around the same time the town of Elmendorf was founded, a man named Frank Ball moved there. And Frank is credited with basically building the town. Shit. Because he was a businessman. Business. Frank was an entrepreneur with a capital E. He took out a loan, built a cotton gin, and this was cotton country. Elmendorf was huge in the cotton exporting business, as well as exporting bricks, pottery, and clay. And then railroad tracks were laid. And the railroad put a depot right in the heart of town, which helped Frank's business pop off. Fuck. Good for him. Frank became an extremely wealthy man. He started buying and selling farms, like the original... Chip and Joanna Gaines. <gasps> Chip and Joe. I haven't watched them in a while because didn't they get into some controversy? I think so. Probably. <sighs> like David Rose, he opened a general store and he sold your basic goods. Snacks, shoes, caskets, whatever you might need on any given day. I want a gift that's just a casket full of snacks. Why did I know that that's exactly what, what you were going to say? say? A little coffin. Tiny casket with some tater tots. Some tater tachos. Tater tachos. <gasps> <laughs> he also built the first stone home in the area, which he Thanks. and his wife Elizabeth raised their eight children. Yikes. In. That's too many. A lot. And their kids were very successful. Frank Ball Jr. worked for the school district and became a school trustee. Raymond Ball opened his own grocery store, which also held the post office. He married a local teacher named Jane, and Jane was eventually appointed postmaster by President Franklin Delano Roosevelt. What the fuck? A position <laughs> that she insane. served for in for twenty seven years. Thanks, Jane. Her husband Raymond became Elmendorf's first mayor when it was finally incorporated in nineteen sixty three. So the Ball family overall was very wealthy. I did read in one article that they were the richest family in town. Well, she's... Very prominent. Mm -hmm. They essentially made the town. Mm -hmm. And then there was Joe Ball. Oh, fuck. There's always one bad one. One bad seed amongst the rich soil. That was good. Is that a saying? It should be. Okay. I know bad seed is a thing, but... Yeah, for sure. And the rich soil, because they were wealthy, yeah, it all that's worked. That's what I meant. Yeah, I know. I picked up on that. Thanks. Joe is who we're going to focus on today. Ah. Uh. Joseph Douglas Ball was born on January 7th, 1896. Growing up, he mostly kept to himself. He liked the outdoors. He liked to go fishing and exploring, like a lot of kids do. But once he became a teenager, what he really liked was guns. He loved them. How many times on this podcast have we been like, this person had 70 guns and they loved that? Why do people love guns? I don't. I don't understand it. I don't either. There's that weird argument for men that it's like a phallic symbol for them, like a symbol of like masculinity. Or I something. never even thought about that. Oh. We could get into a whole discussion about that. That's interesting. I'm going to look that up. I bet there's like psychological research about why people like weaponry yeah it's it's just bizarre to me joe would spend hours every week practicing his shooting so it came as no surprise that when the u.s entered world war one joe enlisted <laughs> and headed off to europe to serve on the front lines he was overseas for two years before being honorably discharged in 1919 and returning to his hometown in texas Joe's brother Raymond said that when Joe returned from the war, he just wasn't the same. The things he saw on the front lines took a huge toll on his mental health, as it would. It's the classic trajectory of a killer. It is. You really foreshadowed that, mm. in case you couldn't tell from well, the Well, I mean, of the we're talking about eating alive, <laughs> so I'm assuming. <laughs> and in the early 1900s, Mental health wasn't exactly something people paid attention oh, to shit. or even acknowledged. <laughs> he couldn't just log onto the internet and be like, I need to find a therapist nearby. They'd be like, are you okay? Do you need a lobotomy? Exactly. They'd be like, let's just drill a hole in his let's head and shake things and up. Bop it up, bop. He did not have a lobotomy, just to be clear. Joe struggled a lot, not just from the trauma he experienced in the war, but also reacclimating back into his normal life as a citizen. Yeah. 
He worked for his father for a bit before following in his dad's footsteps and becoming an entrepreneur himself. With a lowercase e? Yeah. I mean, earlier you when you were talking about his dad, you were like, he was an entrepreneur with a capital E. I'm sorry, I'm tired. No, don't worry, Kate. We're going to get through this. <gasps> we're going to get through, through this. this. <laughs> we're going to get through this. We are struggling this morning because it's early. We were out late. We were out way past my bedtime. Yeah. And there was an armed robbery right by where we live. <laughs> and it was very terrifying. <laughs> And things are just crazy around here it right now. It is. It's all a mess. Prohibition took hold of the country in 1920, and Joe saw this as an opportunity. Oh, shit. He became a bootlegger. <sighs> he had a giant 50-gallon barrel filled with whiskey that he kept in the back of his vehicle, and he'd drive around the area selling alcohol to anyone that wanted it. Business was booming. Oh, well, that's actually a pretty good idea. Yeah, for also, sure. Also, I would love to just like sit out in a field with like an umbrella with my barrel of whiskey and a straw. Why do you need an umbrella? Is it raining? Because it'd be sunny. And oh, I, for the I shade. Don't, I don't want to get a sunburn. True. And be drunk. Wear your sunscreen, everyone. Yikes. I was putting on sunscreen this morning. Uh-huh. And I... I, it was near the end of my tube, so I, you know, when you have to kind of press it down yeah. a little bit, and a bunch shot out, and I, I was hate like, that. Well, "I can't waste it," <laughs> so I just <laughs> slathered it all over my face. <laughs> but then when I tried to put on um, primer, oh yeah, it like bub made the sunscreen bubble up oh, on my nose. That sounds wrong, and that's why my nose is just powder right now. I can't tell. That's but great because you look I, fantastic. <laughs> thanks. It was so red when I woke up this morning. Oh, anyway. Kate, please continue. I apologize. I plan to. Joe's business was booming until mm -hmm. Congress repealed Prohibition in 1933. A setback for Joe, but only a temporary one. Okay. Because Joe thought, if alcohol is going legit, then so will I. And he opened his very own tavern called the Sociable Inn. The front area of the tavern contained the bar, a player piano, like one of those that plays on its own. Ew. Oh, oh, you don't like those? Those are scary. Kind of like them. There were tables where men could drink and play cards and do their manly things. <laughs> Man things. Man things. At the sociable inn. <laughs> and in the back were two bedrooms. Perhaps he thought he'd have uh, a kid one day and need an extra bedroom. I'm going to leave it at that. Of course, if you're going to run a business, you need employees. Mm -hmm. So Joe sent some guys down to the Greyhound bus station. He said people are going to be coming into town looking for work because Elmendorf is popping. So makes sense that the bus station would be a great place to find potential employees. I don't think so. <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> Sorry. It's, it's sounding a little creepy. It's giving creepy. <laughs> If someone came up to me at a bus station and was like, want to work at my inn? <laughs> I'd be like, please get away from me. Yeah, it's not giving the best vibes. He would tell these guys, his scouts, if you will, mm. to watch people as they got off the bus. And he was only interested in hiring women. If the bus passenger was male, don't bother with them. He said if a woman gets off the bus and immediately takes off in one direction, then clearly she knows where she's going. Just let her go on her way. But if a woman gets off the bus and looks around like she's trying to take in her surroundings, she must not know where she is. She must be new in town. She's the one you want to approach. And Joe instructed his scouts to tell these new in town women about his little tavern and offer them jobs as waitresses. My God, men have been scheming and gross for the beginning of time. True. And it seems he told these guys only approach the most attractive women you see because it was known that the sociable inn employed the youngest and prettiest girls in town. Gross. Blech. I mean, gross, no. Despite that Americans were suffering from the devastation of the Great Depression, Joe's business was doing quite well. I think people were eager to drink their troubles away, and it didn't hurt that Joe's employees were all young and attractive. Joe himself was not much of a looker, but that's just my opinion. Do you have a picture? I do. Okay. We'll post it. Okay. And it's also the opinion of a lot of the residents of Elmendorf. They said he was ugly. Mm. However, he seemed to get women, so I don't understand. Well, I wonder under what means. In addition to all the women he had waitressing for him, Joe hired a young black man named Clifton Wheeler to be his handyman and do odd jobs here and there. Hmm. According to many people, 
Clifton was terrified of Jill. Oh, that's never good. And he wasn't the only one. Oh, no. Lawrence Ledecky, who was a teenager at the time Jill was running his tavern, Mm -hmm. said Jill used, this is fucked up, said Jill used to shoot at Clifton's feet to, quote, make him dance the jitterbug. I don't love that. Polly Merian, a longtime resident of Elmendorf, said everyone was afraid of Jill. In an article written by Michael Hall in 2002 for Texas Monthly, and this article, I'm going to link it. It's a great source. She said that residents were always suspicious of him, that he was, quote, a dirty rat and was especially mean to black people. So he sounds like a bit of a so shitbag. he's bag. a racist. He's a racist shitbag. Racist, sexist, pig. Despite the success of his tavern, Jill wanted more. He felt that in order for his business to thrive, he needed some sort of gimmick to reel in customers. Gimmick? So he had a hole dug behind the bar, probably made Clifton do it, which was then cemented and filled with water. In a documentary I found on YouTube that I'll link in the show notes, Joe's nephew with the best name, Bucky, Bucky Ball. (gasps) Bucky, Bucky Ball. Bucky Ball tells of how his uncle would venture out to an area about four miles outside of Elmendorf called the Gray Lakes. The San Antonio River ran close to it, and when it would rain a lot, water would recess back into the Gray Lakes and accumulate. And apparently, alligators love this. Oh. Bucky said his dad, Raymond, and his uncle, Joe, would go to the Gray Lakes looking for alligators. They'd tie one end of a rope around the alligator's head and the other end to a tree. When Why? It, well, when an alligator catches its prey, it spins and drowns it and mm-hmm. then brings it out of the water to eat it. Mm-hmm. So when Raymond and Joe roped the, the alligator, it would spin and spin, eventually spinning itself right up to the tree. Oh, oh. My knowledge of alligators is limited, to say the least, so I'm just going to go with Bucky Ball on this one. Once the alligator was up by the tree, the men would tie its mouth closed and throw it in the back of Joe's truck. They captured five alligators in this manner and transported them to that new pit located in the backyard of the bar, enclosing it with a 10-foot-high wire fence. Joe would then charge people to view his new pets. But he didn't stop there. I mean, alligators are ferocious and can be very scary, but they're also animals just doing their thing in nature. They're just trying to be what they were born to be. be, They're what they are, what they are. They were born this way. (laughs) And Lady Gaga starts playing in the background and they're like, there's a bunch of alligators dancing. dancing. (laughs) Joe did not stop with just charging people Mm -hmm. to look at the alligators. He took it a step further. For any animal lover out there, you might want to skip ahead about 30 seconds because this is horrific. Every Saturday, Joe would put on a show for his customers. He would bring in stray animals, any that he could find, kittens, puppies. No. And he would throw them alive into the alligator pit. And people loved this what the fuck i would not want to watch that no they if, would... it, if it was if he was feeding them like dead stuff sure these were screaming kittens little yapping <sighs> puppies no 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 yes these people would cheer as these poor little animals would be bitten in half and devoured joe even invited customers to bring whatever animal they wanted and let them throw it into the pool People are not okay. And when I tell you something later that happens with the people of this town, you're going to be like, what the fuck? Like, why are people the way they are? I don't know, but this is a scary time in in history. Additionally, Joe would host cockfights in the bar, much to his customers' delight. These atrocities only helped his business grow. For a man who abused animals, treated black people horribly, was described as someone most people feared and who wasn't even hot... He oddly had a way with the ladies. Around 1934, Joe met Minnie Gotthart. I'm not sure if I'm saying her last name right, but I'm doing my best. Who, for reasons I still have yet to uncover, was nicknamed Big Minnie 
which just seems rude. I'm taking that as my nickname. I'm wondering if it's because her name was Minnie, and so it's just and like a play, like on a play on that. Play on words, yeah. So maybe Big Minnie is going to be my drag name. Minnie was 13 years younger than Joe. She was 25, and he was 38. And Joe really liked her, and she actually began running the bar with him. And it sounds like she was good at her job because she wasn't afraid of the drunk guys. Like, she could handle her own. But customers did not share Joe's affection. They described Minnie as, quote, a bossy, displeasing, and obnoxious person. To me, it just sounds like... I mean, she just sounds like a boss bitch. She sounds like like she was a woman in the 30s. Right. Who wasn't going to let some drunk guy harass her. And she shouldn't. You know, big... I like Big Minnie already. Yeah, I think Big Minnie was, like, where it's at. Okay. But Joe was not a one-woman kind of guy. While he was seeing Minnie, he started dating one of his waitresses, Dolores Goodwin. Everyone called Dolores Buddy, but that got a little confusing for me when I was researching this, so I'm going to refer to her as Dolores. Buddy? I don't think anyone wants to be called Buddy. It was a term of affection. Like, that's how she referred to herself, too, I believe. And Oh, <laughs> yeah, my I mean, name's Buddy. Yeah. I I'm mean, from I, Elmendorf. Yeah, I think that's exactly what it was. If you happen to research anything about this, you mm-hmm. keep coming across the name Buddy. It's Dolores. It's Dolores. <laughs> yes, but I just, it got confusing for me, so I'm only calling her Dolores through this. Little Dee Dee. Dolores was 15 years younger than Joe, and she couldn't help but fall in love with him. Maybe that's why he needed two bedrooms, like one for his girlfriend, one for his other girlfriend. I don't know. I mean, we also don't know what his dick looks like. And I hope we never do. Well, I'm just saying, maybe that's why he's so popular. Yeah, I doubt it. He doesn't seem to have any wonderful physical qualities qualities about him. (laughs) One night in 1937, Joe threw a bottle at Dolores, hitting her in the face, which left a scar that ran from her eye to her neck. But Dolores was like, it's all good, babe. Still love ya. Oh, my God. He, like, pennywised her. Around that same time, 22-year-old Hazel Brown got hired as a waitress at the Sociable Inn. And Hazel was 19 years younger than Joe. So he just keeps going younger and younger. Mm -mm 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 -mm. Hazel was absolutely beautiful. Everyone describes her as just, like, this gorgeous young girl. Full of confidence, customers and employees alike all loved her. Everyone called her Schatzi, which is a German term of affection, meaning like sweetheart or jewel or darling. Hazel and Dolores became good friends. Mm. But what Dolores didn't know was that Hazel began secretly dating her boyfriend, Joe. So for those keeping count, Joe is now seeing three women at the same time, Minnie, Dolores, and Hazel, and they all work for him. Minnie couldn't stand Dolores. She probably knew Joe was cheating on her with her, obviously. I mean, maybe. And she didn't hide her distaste for her. So now we've got a little love quadrangle going on. Mm -hmm. Joe was getting tired of Minnie, and he was probably exhausted remembering which girl was which, because that's like a lot of work. One relationship is hard enough, but then when you're trying to juggle, keep it simple, everybody. One day in June of 1937, Joe invited Minnie for a day date. He said, Let's go to the beach. It'll be so romantic. No, it won't. He made Clifton drive them there because, of course, he wouldn't even drive his own dates, this asshole. What a fucker. According to Bucky, Joe's nephew Mm -hmm. with the world's best name, Joe and Minnie and Clifton Mm -hmm. drove to Port Aransas and went swimming. I looked it up. Port Aransas is about 180 miles from San Antonio. So this was a long ass drive way out of town. After they swam, the two lovebirds sat on the beach enjoying the waves, and Joe said to her, stand up, let's watch the sunset. First off, don't make her get up to watch the sunset. You can watch the sunset fine from just sitting down. Exactly. This guy is so annoying. But turns out Joe didn't actually care whether or not Minnie saw the sunset. Just as she stood up, he shot her in the back of the head. Oh my God. Then he called to Clifton to come and help him dig a hole in the sand. And Clifton, terrified of Joe, Did the, it. the mean, girlfriend-killing, yeah. alligator-owning racist, felt he had no choice. But the problem with digging a hole in the sand is that as water washes ashore, it fills the hole up. So the two men had to go and get some kind of a machine to dig a hole deep enough in the sand where they tossed Minnie's body. According to Bucky from this documentary I watched, she was buried about 15 feet deep. So this was like 
That's pretty Some deep. big ass machine. What the fuck? I don't know. So were there no other people around? Was this to like a remote location? I think they found a little secluded spot. Secluded, mm-hmm. okay. When Clifton asked why he killed Minnie, Joe replied, I had no choice. She was pregnant and I'm seeing Dolores. So he I cheated had no on her. Choice. Got her pregnant and then killed her and their unborn child. Ugh, Kate. When people, including Minnie's family, started questioning where she was, Joe told them she'd gotten pregnant by a black man, though that wasn't the word he used. And so she skipped town. No one seemed to notice that she left all her clothes and belongings behind. (laughs) That September, three months after he committed this murder, he and Dolores got married. Great. Amazing. How wonderful. I wonder if Dolores knew. And once they were hitched... Joe confessed his crime to Dolores, uh, saying Minnie wouldn't make any more trouble for them because he'd taken her to the beach and killed her. He just, like, really laid it all out for her. Dolores, with this juicy secret, just couldn't keep it to herself. No shit. But she didn't go to the police. No. Instead, she told her good friend, Hazel Brown, who she didn't realize was, was also, also seeing Joe. sleeping with Joe. Ah, oh, this is a weird. Uh... <laughs> Did Dolores separate from her murderous husband? No. Did Hazel stop seeing him? No. You are correct. A few months later, in January of 1938, Dolores was in a horrible accident and lost her arm. She and Joe were driving from San Antonio back to Elmendorf, and she was behind the wheel. She was about to make a left-handed turn, so she held her arm out to single to single. No. So she held her arm out to signal. And just as she did, a truck carrying a wide load of cedar posts sideswiped them, and it essentially ripped Dolores' arm off. She had to have it amputated. But rumors flew around town that it was Joe who had cut off her arm and fed it to the alligators. (laughs) And in a small town like Elmendorf, it was easy for rumors to grow. Yeah. Which is what makes separating fact from fiction a little little difficult difficult. in this case. Three months after losing her arm... Dolores disappeared. Shortly after that, Hazel fell for someone new, a customer who was a regular at Joe's Tavern. He owned a home and had a good job, and he was ready to give her the life she dreamed of. But when she tried to break things off with Joe, it didn't go so great. Hazel threatened to go to the police and tell them that Joe had killed Minnie Gotthardt. And the next thing you know, Hazel disappeared. Now, three women who had all worked for Joe Ball were missing. Do you think he killed Dolores because she lost her arm and he was like, I'm not going to like be with this armless. I can't answer that question right now. Oh, we'll get there. Okay, that's what I think. Okay, not a great track record for a business owner when your employees just kind of disappear. Disappear. (laughs) One of the top priorities for any business owner should be avoid having multiple employees go missing. But that wasn't Joe's motto. Minnie's family started asking questions again because they hadn't been able to locate her anywhere. So they enlisted the help of the Bexar County Sheriff's Office. Sheriff's? Of the- I know what you meant. Thank you. Sheriff's Office. <laughs> it's one of those mornings. <laughs> Being Minnie's last known lover and boss, Joe was questioned multiple times. But officers never could find any evidence of foul play, and he was dismissed as a suspect in her disappearance. Then a few months later, 23-year-old Julia Turner went missing. Guess who her boss was? Joe. Joe. So sheriff's deputies went to question Joe again. They were like, it's weird that all your waitresses keep vanishing. Do you know anything about that? And he said that Julia had confided in him that she was having personal problems and just wanted to move on, leave town. And so the officers were like, okay. But when they searched Julia's home, they found that all her clothing and belongings were still there. She hadn't taken anything with her. So they went back to Joe's bar. And this time he said, oh my God, I totally just remembered. Julia was having problems with her roommate and didn't want to go back home. So I, being the amazing man I am, loaned her $500 so she could just leave town. Skip town. But again, they didn't have evidence to the contrary. So the officers were like, okay, have a great day. During the next few months, 
Two more of Joe's waitresses went missing along with a teenage boy that used to hang around the bar. Newspapers in San Antonio wrote about the disappearance of more than a dozen waitresses, including a woman named Stella. Witnesses claimed Stella had had a fight with Joe about Minnie before Minnie went missing. But every time deputies brought Joe in for questioning, he maintained his innocence, stating that people had simply left town and moved on. Oh my God. Without any evidence, Joe was in the clear. Stella. What movie is that where the guy yells, Stella? Stella! The guy being Marlon Brando and the oh. movie being A Streetcar Named Desire. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. That's yeah, right. Yeah. Also, I was thinking of Stella Adler. Oh, that's different. That's way different. It seemed like Joe is untouchable. The cops had nothing concrete on this guy. I'm sure they also probably drink at the sociable inn. Very likely. It's a very small town. That is until September 23rd, 1938, when a neighbor of Joe's reported a foul-smelling barrel that had been left behind Joe's sister's barn. The man told his complaint to Deputy Sheriff John Gray and said the barrel was covered with flies and smelled like something dead was inside. Knowing the reputation Joe had of losing waitresses, Sheriff Gray and Deputy John Clevenhagen decided to pay Joe a little visit. I do like his name. I like that name. And they wanted to check out the barrel, Ops. But they waited an entire day before going out to the barn to investigate. And when they arrived, the barrel, like so many things in Joe's life, had disappeared. Disappeared. They went to the bar to talk to Joe, but, quote, He didn't know anything about it. He was like, barrel? What barrel? So the officers told Joe, how about you come back with us to your sister's? We'll just check with her. So they all went back to the barn together. Joe's sister corroborated everything the neighbor had reported. She was like, as a matter of fact, there was a fly-infested barrel that smelled of rotting flesh now that I think of it. (laughs) Oh my God! You know, it totally it slipped my mind. Yeah, but out back that does was ring a, a bell. horrible sight, and you know, I just forgot about it. Yeah, thank you for reminding me. Deputy Jeez. John Clevenhagen was a good friend of Joe's. What? They were hunting buddies, and he's like, "Look, dude, it's not looking good for you. People in your life just keep vanishing, and now there's a missing barrel that smelled like a dead person. Come on." A barrel that was exactly the same size as the one you used to drive around in your truck to sell whiskey? A 50-gallon barrel? This is weird. He said, I hate to do this, but I've got orders to take you in to San Antonio. Wow. So this was a step up. He wasn't just being questioned by the Elmendorf police. He was being taken into the station. The station. They were building a case. And Joe said, all right, all right, well... Can you take me back to the tavern for a minute so I can have a beer, get my money from the cash register, and just close everything up? And the deputies agreed. No. When they got back to the tavern, Joe poured himself a beer, he took a few sips, and he walked over to the cash register, which was against the wall. And the deputies stood behind him as he opened the register. But instead of pulling out any cash... He pulled out a, a gun. .45 caliber pistol. According to Michael Hall's article in Texas Monthly, Joe then waved his gun at Deputy Gray and his good friend and hunting buddy, Deputy Clevenhagen, who shouted, Don't! Clevenhagen then reached for his own pistol. But before he could retrieve it, Joe pointed his gun at his own heart and pulled the trigger. Fuck. Falling to the barroom floor. Oh my God. He died instantly. He knew he was he was caught. Caught. <laughs> Joe's nephew, Bucky, describes the scene a bit differently. He said he heard about what happened from his dad, Raymond, Joe's brother. And Raymond heard about it from Clevenhagen himself. Raymond told Bucky that Joe took his gun out of the cash register, but knew that if he shot himself with the deputies behind him, the bullet would go through him and hit his good friend, Clevenhagen. So he turned toward the deputies so that the bullet would go through him and into the wall trying to spare his friend because he's such a good guy. Good. One good (laughs) deed amongst a a bag of shit. Soon, multiple deputies arrived at the tavern to search the property, looking for clues as to what might have happened to all those missing people. Alligators. When they checked the alligator pond, they found it was surrounded by rotting meat along with an axe that was, quote, matted with blood and hair. 
Meanwhile, sheriffs took Clifton Wheeler, who everyone knew to be Joe's handyman, to San Antonio for questioning. Surely he must know something. And Clifton was ready to talk. He sang like a canary. Reportedly, he denied knowing anything for a while, but then eventually was like, you know what? I do know everything about this shit bag. <laughs> Let me just tell you everything. He told the officers all about how Joe had killed Minnie and how when Hazel threatened to go to the authorities about it, he killed her too. After killing Hazel, he placed her body in a barrel, the one he temporarily stored behind his sister's barn. Then one night, Joe and Clifton got really drunk and Joe told Clifton to, quote, load up the car. He said, we're going to need blankets and plenty of beer. As Clifton did this, he noticed Joe added a few other things to the car. A saw, an axe, a post hole digger, which is just a tool used to dig holes in the ground, usually for fence posts, mm. and a pistol. The two men then drove to Joe's sister's barn, where they picked up the 50-gallon barrel covered in flies, They drove to a bluff near the San Antonio River. Joe pointed the gun at Clifton and said, start digging. Then they opened up the barrel and Hazel Brown's body came tumbling out. Now, a post hole digger isn't designed to dig a human sized grave, believe it or not. That That wasn't sick when you said because like the I know the barrel is like chunky. So Joe's plan was to dismember Hazel's body. Clifton refused to help him. He was like, I'll help you dig graves and transport bodies, but I draw the line at dismemberment. What kind of man do you think I am? So Joe attempted (laughs) to do it himself, and this is going to get graphic. Oh, shit. He began sawing off Hazel's head, but got pissed because one of her hands kept getting in the way. Wait, what? I think her body was probably stiff. Oh, and God, so, rigor mortis. Yeah. So Clifton helped out by holding her hand along with her arms and legs as Joe continued sawing. Both men became nauseous, so they drank more beer. And yes, exactly. Because that's what, that's you do. what you do. Every time I have a tummy ache, I'm like, hey, give me the alcohol. I'm like, take me to the bar. And once they finished dismembering Hazel's body into six pieces, two arms, two legs, her head and torso... They buried her, but they only buried her arms, legs, and torso. They threw her head and clothes onto a campfire. This is horrific and awful and disgusting, but at the same time, like in my head, I'm imagining, I hear Count Von Count's voice being like, one, two, three body parts. Oh my God. (laughs) Sorry. I'm having to make light of it in my mind. I get it. (laughs) As the fire burned, Joe and Clifton just sat there drinking beer before driving back to the bar. Are they blacked out? They've been drinking like through this whole thing. I think they probably drank a lot. So their tolerance was oh, that's right. They work at a bar. Quite high. Probably always drunk. Clifton agreed to take the officers to Hazel's burial site. Onlookers gathered around, people eager to see the remains of a woman being dug up. As Clifton began digging. Blood bubbled up in the dirt. She'd only been in the ground a couple of days, if even that long. Clifton pulled up two arms, then two legs, and finally pulled her torso from the ground. The smell was unbearable. The sightseers scattered in all directions. Most of them were vomiting. Not sure what you expected when you went to go see a body dug up, but people were like, I'm sick. Who are these people? I mean, I think these are the people that would probably like listen to our podcast these days. Probably. You know, like, <laughs> Where are where's they? the body? Are any of them still alive? I don't think so. I just can't imagine being like, they're going to go dig up the body. And, and everyone's like, to- okay. Ah, and we have to go watch. Yeah. The officers asked, where's the head? Oh. And Clifton pointed to the remains of the campfire nearby. When the officers sifted through the ashes, they found a jawbone, some teeth, and pieces of Hazel's skull. And they burned the head? Mm-hmm. Why? I think it was probably trying to, to disguise her. Yeah. Uh. Clifton also led officers to the beach where Joe had killed Minnie. They had buried her several feet deep in the sand, so police had to hire people and use heavy machinery in order to get to her. It was a spectacle that lasted for days because it took a while to find her. 
practically the entire town came out to watch. Mm -hmm. A business owner set up a concession stand selling cold drinks. <laughs> it was like a fucking circus. <laughs> There's like two little girls with like a lemonade stand. Okay. Like <laughs> it's funny you say that because I'm going to post this picture. There is a little girl. Oh, wow. This is the look on her face. She's like, why the fuck did my mom bring me here? That's yeah, child abuse. It's <laughs> horrific. The San Antonio Light reported on this event, stating, quote, excitement and rumors ran high. Other dunes looked suspiciously like burial mounds and mysterious shapes were seen walking around at night. What? I think they were just trying to make a story and be like, it's haunted and all these dead bodies the are coming media. up. media. Oh, you shitheads. As word spread, the crowds grew larger. That picture I'm talking about with the little girl, there's also a woman right in front holding her nose. They're all peering into this grave. And it's like, what the fuck is happening? Like, there's so many people. Hundreds came out to see this. Like, literally the whole town, because the town was only hundreds of people. Times were wild back then. I don't know that I'd ever do that, though. I mean, I guess there wasn't a lot to do in Elmendorf, Texas in sure. the 1930s. So everyone's like, let's go watch this body be dug up out of the sand. To be fair... I probably would have gone and watched it back then. Back I, then. Yeah, I think I probably agree with you, Kate, actually. Finally, on October 14th, Minnie's body was found. She was buried so deep in the sand, which was really cold, that she was very well preserved. Yeah, like the permafrost in um, Siberia. You were so quick with that. Well, I think about it a lot. In the search of Joe's property, officers found a scrapbook with photos of dozens of women, along with a packet of letters. One of these letters was from Minnie. According to a 1938 article in Sheriff's Association magazine, <laughs> I bet that's an interesting magazine. Minnie told Joe in the letter, to be clear, this letter was written pre her death. So I don't want it to be confusing. Like she came back and was a ghost and wrote letters. She wasn't dead and she was so well preserved that she came out of she the sand and she was to... like, What the fuck? She and was she like, wrote a letter. Let me catch up on my correspondence. She's like, Where's the lemonade girls? I'm thirsty. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry that that happened to her, though. That's awful okay but the letter in yes. the letter she wrote quote i am still willing to break up you and dolores if it is the last thing i do uncle henry and i are going to take you to jail as soon as he gets here i'm going to testify as to what i know so what the fuck did minnie know oh my god it's never you never find you out never find out Investigators believe the photos in the scrapbook could lead to answers as to what happened to several women who had gone missing. They felt that this was going to solve a lot of murders. So do you think that maybe something happened prior to Minnie? Because what it sounds like was that Minnie is the first known murder yes. victim of Joe. What people theorize is that he was feeding people. To the alligators. And she knew about it because she ran the bar with him. Right. If you know something like that, does Why that make you, report you it? accountable in some way for not yeah, for saying sure. anything? But also, she was like a strong person. Mm -hmm. But I wonder if he was like had some kind of control over her. I think it was the early 1900s and he was a man and she was a woman. Different and, times. Yeah. yeah. That sucks. But also, like, let's stop it. Like, let's do something to stop it. But we don't even know if that's what it was. We don't know what it was. Knew. This is speculation. It's so bizarre. It's all speculation. So they had a couple of theories regarding Joe and the missing people, mm -hmm. these investigators. Initially, they believed that he'd mutilated them and fed them to his alligators. It seems like an obvious guess. In fact, ever since 1932, a rumor had been circulating that an old man had happened upon Joe when he was throwing a woman into the alligator pit. And when Joe saw him, he threatened to kill him. So the old man left town and went to California. At least that's how the rumor goes. Several other people claimed they had seen Joe with their own eyes throw pieces of human flesh into the pit. Uh, sure. I mean, how they knew it was human how flesh. Do you know it's human flesh. Yeah, exactly. It's one of those things that's impossible to prove either way. Unless it's like a hand or a foot or something. Ooh. I mean, it could have been. 
And as if the murders weren't enough, the police decided to throw in a random drug dealing accusation just for good measure. Just for funsies. They believed he was storing the drugs in bottles and keeping those bottles in the pit. But they drained that pit and they found no drugs. Uh, yeah. Nor did they find any human remains. The alligators were given to the San Antonio Zoo where they lived out the rest of oh, their good. days I wanted, as a tourist attraction. I was going to ask you, like, what happened to those gators? Mm -hmm. Have you ever eaten gator meat? That's a no for me. Oh, I have. It's good. It's delicious. I think they sell it at Taste of Chicago. Do they? I, I had it so. when I was in um, Florida. <laughs> Go figure. Mm -hmm. As for the missing people, some of them were found alive. Dolores being one of them. Buddy. She had left Joe and moved to San Diego to live with her sister. Two weeks after they tracked her down, they found another woman who had moved to Phoenix. Others were found living in San Antonio. So some of the people were found. Wait, I thought he killed Dor Dolores. I never said he killed Dolores. I said she disappeared. She disappeared. Uh, Kate, you trickster. I'm not a trickster. Kate I just simply us. stated facts. No, I'm you inferred something that was incorrect. Sure, her arm came off, and yes. she's fine. She did lose her arm, and three months later, she disappeared to San Diego to live with her sister. Oh, she escaped. So some people were found, but others never were. Clifton Wheeler received a sentence of two years in prison for his role in disposing of the bodies of Minnie and Hazel. I mean, I understand that, but at the same time, like, we, we need to understand his situation. Right. And I being mean, manipulated and controlled by a fucking murderer, crazy person. And Joe was white and, and Clifton he was, was black. black. God damn it. He denied knowing anything about any of the other missing people, though. Once he was released, he opened up his own bar. What was it called? Doesn't have a name because it didn't last long. Oh. His reputation preceded him. Oh, man. Unfortunately, he was constantly hounded by the residents, and eventually he packed left up down. and left Almendorf. I think that's probably for the best. Unfortunately, no one knows what happened to him after I that. I hope he lived out a great life, and I hope he was able to, like, forget. I hope so. I doubt it, because that's crazy shit that yeah. you don't forget, but I hope he had a good rest of his life. Joe Ball's legend has only grown over the years. He's known as the Butcher of Elmendorf, the Bluebeard of South Texas, or simply the Alligator Man. Those all, again, sound like, you know, fantasy movie titles. It, absolutely. The Butcher of Elmendorf, the Bluebeard of Texas, or whatever. Magazines have picked up the story along with books like the Encyclopedia of Serial Killers and America's Most Vicious Criminals. And... If someone printed a mistake, someone else would pick that up and reprint it. So you'll find articles online that state Joe shot himself in the head, not the heart, even though his relatives, the deputies that were present, and the coroner's report all state he shot himself in the chest. But it's just weird like how someone will quickly want to print a story and get it wrong, and then, boom, 20 other outlets have it wrong. So wait a second. Did he actually feed anybody to an alligator? We will never know. Okay. Because it sounds like maybe he didn't because he buried Minnie and Hazel. Like he didn't feed them. It sounds like if he was feeding people, he would have fed them to the alligators. We just don't know what happened to those other women that were never went found. Missing. And that teenage oh boy. Right. God damn it. Some falsely report that Clifton's name was actually Wilford Sneed and that Sneed had chopped up 20 women and chunks of their flesh were found in the alligator pit. It sounds like this was a very sensationalized oh, story. Oh, 100%, and it's still being told. Mm -hmm. No human remains were found in the pit, though. Doesn't mean Joe didn't clean them up, but none were found there. Sure. Did they bar make the alligators barf up anything in their stomachs? Well, it would have been so long after oh, the fact. Oh, that's true. Yeah, it would have digested. Just imagine, like, trying to make an alligator throw up. I'm going to be sick. Don't <laughs> Sorry, say it. I'm going to be sick. <clears throat> I don't Try know why I had, a, I had a visceral reaction to that. <laughs> I had a visceral reaction when you were talking about Hazel's body coming I, up. Yeah, it's we're gross. both we're both like trying not to throw up. <laughs> I can't handle it. <laughs> this closet is warm. Dolores attempted to set the record straight back in 1957. Dolores said, "Quote: Joe never put no people in that alligator tank. Joe wouldn't do a thing like that. He wasn't no horrible monster. Joe was a sweet, kind, good man, and he never hurt nobody unless he was driven to it. When asked about the giant scar on her face from when he threw a bottle at her, she said, quote, 
He didn't even mean to cut me. He was throwing the bottle at another guy. And there were just two murders. That's all, Kevin. It's just the two Dolores. murders. Dolores. You know, plus the murders of countless defenseless animals. I mean, he was super sweet. Yeah, he hit me in the face with the bottle that left me scarred for life. Totally, but he meant to throw it at someone else and scar that person. So he was actually I don't a blame really good him man. For any... <laughs> oh, honey. Honey. Buddy. <laughs> Buddy. Toby Hooper's 1976 film, Eaten Alive, is loosely based on Joe Ball. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is very 70s. The killer oh, in it mainly kills sex workers. Oh, He no. has a thing against them. But you do see pieces of the truth in the scenes. Okay. In the movie, the killer keeps a list of his kills, which feels reminiscent of Joe's scrapbook. Yeah. He has a giant axe that he uses as a weapon. Uh, and like I said, a young Robert England uh, is in it. And to me, it feels like he's meant to be the teenage boy that would hang around Joe's tavern. Mm -hmm. I just imagine like <laughs> he's like this scruff guy and like he opens up his scrapbook and it's cut out flowers from construction paper. <gasps> and he's like pasting stuff with like shiny letters. And he's like, I just love doing that. He's got his elbow macaroni art. Yeah. <laughs> If you want to watch the movie, it's free on Peacock uh, and I think Tubi and probably another, a couple other streaming services. And that is the case of the alligator man, Joe Ball, who inspired the film Eaten, Eaten Alive, Alive by Toby Hooper. And you can let us know your thoughts on this episode on Instagram, Facebook, or YouTube at... Patreon. Nope. That's not it. I know. I'm sorry. I knew what to say, and my mind, my mouth said something, but my head <laughs> said something different. You can do that on <laughs> Instagram and all that stuff. It's Horrorwood Podcast. Or you can send us an email at... Horrorwoodpodcast at gmail.com. And now is the moment, Kevin. You can jump on over to patreon.com slash horrorwood podcast. There it is. Thanks, everybody. We're going to go drink more coffee now. I'm going to go chug some coffee and then maybe shock myself into being awake. <laughs>